Welcome to this week's edition of the FA Show. I'm Nate Barrett. We start this week with good news out of the Wells Fargo camp. In a statement acknowledging a slow 2020, Wells said of recruiting Kimberly to touted recent successes. Quote, there were not a lot of people making wholesale changes to their business in 2020. And so coming out of that, we're seeing a tick back up. Ta said in an Advisor Hub story highlighting more than half a dozen recent hires in the last month. Wells also recently recruited three external practices into its nascent custody channel for registered investment advisory firms in recent months, with Ta adding, quote, the growth that we are seeing in our external pipeline is very, very encouraging. Advisors curious about changes at Wells that have helped spur this uptick are encouraged to check out a recent webinar interview with Ta linked in the notes and at the end of this episode. SEC Chair Gary Gensler continues to turn up the heat on trading apps and robo-advising platforms, voicing concern over their gamification and digital engagement tactics. Quote, in many cases, these tactics may encourage investors to trade more often and also invest in different products or change their investment strategy, Gensler said. However, voices inside the SEC are not unified as Commissioner Hester Pierce pushed back against the calls for more regulation, raising concerns that putting guardrails around online trading platforms could limit investor opportunity or try new products. You can read more on this topic at advisorhub.com. Are you more challenged by getting a prospect into your office or by closing the prospect? Do you believe that once a prospect is in your office, they'll actually become a client? What do you think your answer says about you or an advisor in general? Hi, I'm Jeff Crosby, a $5 million Barron's top advisor in the Seattle area, 24-time Ironman triathlete, former college basketball player and coach, entrepreneur, husband, father, and hopefully a lifelong learner. Finding the answers to those questions builds the basis for our next two episodes as I help you produce these two must-have items. We'll break them down and get started right after this. There are two must-have items for any advisor. One is what I call the elevator speech. Two is the pivot question. You'll have to wait till our next episode to learn about the pivot question. But now let's focus on the elevator speech which is a concise statement that explains who you help and how. Let's suppose you're on an elevator heading to the 20th floor with the CEO of a company. You've only got that amount of time to engage him, her, and you'd like them as a client. And they ask you this question. So what do you do? What would you say with that question? Not only what would you say, but what would you say that would stick out in their mind? Think about it for a minute. If you asked that same question to someone on the elevator and they said, I sell real estate, what might you think? You might think, oh, just another one of them and maybe dismiss it. But what if they said, oh, thanks for asking. I primarily sell homes over $3 million and clients that want a marketing plan that will get an offer on their house within 72 hours and listen it. Let me know if that's you. Hey, have a great day. Side note, that message will be mean nothing to that CEO if you don't follow up. Regarding you as the financial advisor, I believe I have a few good elevator speeches, little talks that will help set you apart from others. If you're interested to get a few from me, please send an email to info at 3xequity.com and we'll send you three. Thanks for watching this episode and our next episode will be on the pivot question how to get that prospect on the elevator into your office. I'll give you some tried and proven ways. Additionally, you can also find a full library of practice management content at 3xequity.com forward slash practice. This week, Tony Sirianni sits down with Ron Krzyzewski, Chairman of the Board of Directors and CEO of Stiefel.
Well, and that's, you know, and that's also the thing that everybody's, you know, it's the good and bad about this business, right? If you're not ready to change and you're not adapting and, and you've done it for so many years, tell us a little bit about, you know, we've just been through tremendous changes, right? And so there's, there's a relative amount, even for an industry that always changes, there's a little bit of anxiety out there about what's next because we have a lot of stuff going on. What, what are you seeing out there? Well, you know, look, I, first of all, if, if it wasn't for change, if it wasn't for anxiety, if it wasn't for uncertainty, uh, we wouldn't have a business, all right? So let's, let's you know, let's, that's what we do is we provide advice uh, trying to understand and answer uncertainty. So it's it's omnipresent, and that's actually good for our business. So change change is good. Uh, look, as I, as I sit here today, it's the day after Labor Day, you know, in my traditional way of thinking, it's the start of the new business year. It's not the end of the year. It's always, to me, uh, as we start after Labor Day. And look what's gonna happen in the next 10 days, okay? I, and I think these are gonna be harbingers of what can happen. And I don't wanna, I'm not taking political sides, Tony, but one, we're gonna have an election in Canada. You know, that's gonna be interesting what happens in Canada. Um, you're gonna have a recall election in California and you're gonna have a, a bill that's gonna approach $4 trillion with pay fors that are all going to be crystallized in the next 10 days, 10 days. And I think that these are interesting, interesting times and are going to shape market, market sentiment going forward. So you had, I think you had, you know, I don't want to get too political about it either, but the, I think there was an idea, let's reshape the tax code, let's reshape, you know, the way the economy is going to work going forward, let's redistribute wealth. And, you know, you, with the elections that we all saw last year, whether it was I want to get rid of this guy versus I really embrace all these ideals. And now that people are looking at stepped up cost basis, you know, uh, increasing capital gains, uh, this it, it, it's it's scary from our point of view. Like you said, yeah, I'm glad we're here to advise people, but what do you say to them? Well, you know, there there it can be balance in everything, and so you know, do do I see the corporate tax rate going up a little bit? Uh, I do. Uh, I think that the, the economy, uh, we'd still be competitive at, say, a 25% rate. We, could, we shouldn't get too excited about that. We should get excited about things where we are taxing capital formation and taxing our investors. I, that's never proven to be good policy. And I think that it's something that, that you really need to think about as, uh, as, as we talk about these reforms. Furthermore, I will tell you that um, I do think that Senator Manchin kind of has it right and that there should be a little bit of, bit of a pause here. Well, we've spent almost $8 trillion uh, since the pandemic began and adding another $4 trillion uh, seems like uh, a little reflection would be, would be good for our policymakers. For the complete interview, as well as other discussions with industry leaders and influencers, visit the Advisor Hub TV section of advisorhub.com. We turn now to Recruiting Wire, powered by 3X Equity, the authority on advisor transitions. Cincinnati's the spot for Rockefeller Capital Management with two big pickups in the Queen City. What a week after hiring a $5 million team for Merrill Lynch, led by partners, lifers, Joseph Mark Holcomb and Michael Frey, they added a $3 million team from UBS. Thomas Unger, who had managed $475 million in customer assets at UBS Wealth Management USA, joined Rockefeller on Friday, along with three support staff, Tricia Fountain, Blair Harrington, and Catherine Casterline. UBS Wealth Management has picked off a Merrill Lynch team in Portland, Maine. The team led by Micah Roberge and Sean Hawkins left Merrill on Friday after 13 years and 10 years respectively. Roberge and Hawkins combined to manage $400 million in customer assets. In the past two weeks, two other large Merrill teams, one in Ohio and one in Washington State, jumped ship with over $5 million and $8 million in revenue respectively. Departing brokers have pointed to a number of triggers, including Merrill's move in 2019 to withhold the first 3% of brokers' production from hitting the payout grid or what they say appear to be bank-imposed compliance restrictions. 
For a complete list of recent moves, as well as access to the Advisor Hub Offers tool to secure your own offers from multiple broker dealers, visit the Deals and Comp section of AdvisorHub.com. Thanks for joining us for this week's edition of the FA Show on Advisor Hub TV, powered by 3X Equity. I'm Nate Barrett. Have a great day.